All right, guys, I think I'm going to go ahead and get started. Uh, it's good to see all of you. Well, sort of. I guess you can see me. <laughs> I, I can't quite see all of you, but I definitely can tell that you're here. Um, and it's great to see you again. Uh, I hope that things are going well. This is week 12 that we're starting right now. I know the craziness of the uh, remote teaching started on around week eight or so. So we've survived uh, pretty well up to this point, uh, as best as I can tell. Hopefully things are going okay for you guys, with, uh, not just with my class, but with all of your classes and with all the other stuff, um, keeping safe and healthy and so on. I hope that, hope that uh, you've been able to, to navigate your way through this, uh, this very strange time. Um, we had a snowstorm here yesterday, <laughs> so I'm still in the middle of winter out here in the mountains. Um, but I'm happy to be kind of cozy indoors today uh, while, while the sun has come back out and, and try to do a little bit of math. Um, so just a quick uh, update. You know, this is going to be a very normal week. Uh, we just have basically a class today, a class Thursday, and uh, homework uh, for both of those days. Um, I don't know how much of the, the homework from today's assignment I'm going to have time to look at during our actual class right now. Um, depends on how far I get with the material on the board behind me here. Um, if I'm not able to get to a lot of uh, the homework, you know, during this regular class period, I will hang around afterwards and I can take some questions then. Uh, and also this evening, uh, I can take some questions. I sent you a Dropbox invite to turn in today's homework assignment. So please do that uh, by the end of uh, tonight uh, so that I can uh, get those over to my grader. And then there is another assignment that's due on Thursday, which is a little bit shorter uh, assignment than the one that we're doing right for today. Um, but anyway, there is another assignment for Thursday and it, it is already posted. We don't have too many more homeworks to go, maybe four or five more assignments and we're gonna be, we're gonna be done with everything. So it's not, not that far till we have a light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, be sure to check your grades online. Make sure that uh, everything is, uh, being recorded correctly. Uh, and I just, uh, I want to remind you as well that um, that um, I have not yet reweighted your grade. I haven't dropped your lowest homeworks or anything like that. So your, your grade in this class, percentage-wise, is higher than what it shows on my, uh, on my website. Um, I hope everybody's hearing me okay. It seems like some people trying to come into the room. Uh, it's okay. There we go. Okay. Um, anyway, so yeah, just let me know if there's any mistakes on your grades. And remember that your grade really is a little bit higher than what it says on my spreadsheet, which I did update uh, over the weekend. Okay. Um, Officer, is there yeah. any extra credit or anything? Because I heard universities. Uh, making some changes for extra credit or these things for uh okay so uh, you're jumping the gun reza on me a little bit here <laughs> um the university is contemplating possibly allowing students to change their grading option to pass no pass but that has not yet been approved by the president of the university so i was going to wait and talk about that on thursday um, there may be some changes coming with regard to your grading option for the class. So we'll, we'll talk about that on Thursday, okay? Okay, thank you. Sure, yes. sure, no worries, no worries. Okay, so I think what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to start by uh, reviewing what we did at the very end of our class last Thursday. We just sort of set the stage for Chapter 8. Uh, and remember that now in Chapter 8, we're going to be going back to differential equations again. And we're gonna see the linear algebra coming up all over the place, basically, uh, as we're studying differential equations in chapters eight and chapters nine. These are the last two chapters that we're going to be covering, okay? Um, so just by way of notation, remember on uh, Thursday, I started using this capital D to represent a derivative operator. So every time you see capital D, I've got it over here, capital D of F is just the derivative of F. Okay, so D just takes the derivative. It's an operator that takes the derivative. And if you see powers of D, then that just means you're going to take 
higher derivatives. So d to the k power just means k derivatives of your function, right? By using this d notation, we can actually write down our differential equations in a little bit of a nicer format using the d notation. So in the middle of the board here, I've reminded you what an nth order linear differential equation looks like. We had written this down way back in January, actually, at the beginning of the semester. An nth order linear differential equation has that form right here in the middle. A naught of x times n derivatives of y plus all of these lower terms equals some function on the right-hand side. Okay, so that's kind of the generic format format of this nth order linear differential equation. But using the D notation that I introduced up here at the top, I can actually express that same differential equation in operator form. Okay, and here's how it's going to look. I suppressed all of the X's on this boxed line. I didn't want to recopy all of the X's from the line before, but you have some coefficient times d to the n plus another coefficient times d to the n minus one, dot, 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 all the way over to a sub n. And all of that, which I'm going to call L, gets applied to y, and we're still going to set it equal to capital F on the right side of the equation. So this is just the same differential equation but written using my D notation, my operator notation, okay? Uh, so on the homework for Thursday, they're gonna give you a differential equation. I think there's at least one problem where they're gonna give you a differential equation in this form, right? And ask you to rewrite it in this form. You don't have to show any work. You just write down the answer. It's pretty easy, okay? So L is just the, notation for this whole operator here, this whole thing in parentheses, which is operating on y. y is your function that you're plugging into your differential equation, right? In fact, a lot of times y is what you're solving for, right? y is that unknown function that you're trying to solve for, okay? So this is all just a quick recap of what we did last time. Um, if there's any questions on it, let me know. Um, I want to do a warm up to practice this uh, basic uh, sort of outline to start chapter eight. So at the bottom here, I've written a, a question and we're going to solve it here in a minute. I've written down a linear operator. So this capital L is a linear operator. Notice that there's an A naught, which is X minus X squared, times D squared plus A1 times d plus a2, right? So the a0, a1, and a2, those are those expressions with the x's in them. So this is just a, what you would call a second order linear operator. Second order because the highest power of d is the second power, okay? So let's take that linear operator and let's just, just plug something into it just to practice, okay? So I made up a function here. This is little y. I can make up anything I want. Let's just suppose I'm gonna use e to the three x plus five x, okay? And the question is, let's find L of y. So I'm gonna come up here and erase the top and I'm gonna put the solution up here at the top of the board. Okay, so let me just get everything out of the way. This was a d squared right here. Okay, so I'm going to do the solution right up here. This is the solution to this warm-up problem. So L of y, let me just write down what that would be. L of y would be I'm going to write down the operator L here, x minus x squared times d squared plus the sine of x times d plus 2x plus e to the x. That's L, and I'm going to apply L to y, which is e to the 3x plus 5x. 
Okay, so that's just L of Y written completely out. Okay, the idea is that each of these terms that is inside of the brackets is going to get applied to Y over here, right? So what I'm going to get is, so when I take this first term, right, what's going to happen? I have X minus X squared times D squared of Y. In other words, let me just call that Y double prime. Okay, so that's two derivatives of Y. Okay, and then the middle term here, sine of X, sine of X, times one derivative of y. And then finally, here's my constant term, so to speak, 2x plus e to the x. Now that has to also be multiplied by y. So I'll just put the y there as well. Okay, so basically you're literally like distributing. It's like distributing. So each of the three terms in the brackets gets distributed to the Y. The first two terms both produce derivatives because of the D's that you see here. Okay, so now we just have to simplify this. X minus X squared. Let's see, I have to take two derivatives of Y. So maybe I can just do this down here. I don't need a lot of room for this part. So the first derivative of e to the 3x plus 5x would be e to the 3x times 3 plus 5. And then when I take another derivative, I'm going to pull down another factor of 3, and I'm going to get 9 times e to the 3x. I need to move this out of your way so you can see that. Okay, so those are just the two derivatives, so let's just plug in. Y double prime was 9e to the 3x. And then the second term here is sine of x times y prime, which was 3e to the 3x plus 5. And then plus the last term, which you don't even need to simplify it here. We can just, we can just leave it multiplied as a factored expression. So I just recopy that last term right over. Okay. So that's what L of Y is equal to. So this is how you apply an operator to a function. When we say find L of Y, we're just applying this derivative operator to whatever the function Y was. Okay, are there any, uh, any questions about that? So far so good? Because this is gonna get really fun very shortly. This is a little tedious right here but this is gonna get really cool. The, the, the actual use of linear algebra is gonna show up here uh, very shortly. Okay, so let me give myself some room on the bottom now. What I'm gonna do, question? I think someone has, has a question. Oh, uh, I'm sorry, Caesar. I see, your, I see your point. I completely dropped that X at the very end. Thank you so much. I'm just trying to make sure you guys are awake out there. <laughs> okay, so yeah, on the far right side, this five should have been five X. Thank you very much. That's just a typo on my part. I apologize for that. Okay, great. So hopefully now it's good. <laughs> um, the thing about this L that we're looking at here, L is always a, sorry, is there a question? No, okay, I'm gonna, uh, there we go, okay. Um, this L is a linear transformation, right? It respects addition and scalar multiplication. Because it's a linear transformation, we can talk about the kernel of L. So we can talk about the kernel of L, and this is what was covered in section 6.3 that I kind of asked you guys to study over spring break, right? The kernel of L. So let me write that down, okay? So since, since L is a linear transformation, Okay, so since L is a linear transformation, we can talk about the kernel of L. The kernel of L 
this is just simply going to be, this is the set of functions, I'll call them y, it's the set of y such that L of y is equal to zero. Right? Do you remember back when we were doing uh, in chapter six, we would have been calling the transformation T and we would have written, we probably wrote it something like this, the set of vectors V and V such that T of V is zero. This is sort of the, the chapter six way. This is the chapter six way of writing what the kernel of T is. Same thing in chapter eight except now we're going to call it L instead of T. But the point is that your vectors are just the functions, I'll call them Y, that get killed by L, right? It's those functions that get killed by L. Okay, so um, this kernel is something we want to look at a little bit. Okay, so let me, let me state for you um, a definition, a, a definition and then a theorem, okay? Again, if there's any questions, guys, feel free to just unmute yourself and you can ask me, ask me any questions, okay? And you can always go back and watch this later if you need to sort of refresh your, your memory about it. So given a differential equation, so given a differential equation, which I'm going to write as L of Y equals F, remember that is, that is a differential equation. Right? This is a compacted form of writing a differential equation. So given that, right, the associated, the associated homogeneous, we've seen this kind of word before, the associated homogeneous differential equation is simply L of Y equals zero. Okay, that's all it is. So in other words, you just change the capital F to a zero and this becomes another differential equation, but with a zero on the right hand side of it. Okay, so you can always take a differential equation and just lop off whatever's on the right side of the equal sign and you get this associated homogeneous differential equation by just uh, putting a zero on the right side. Solving the associated homogeneous differential equation simply amounts to finding the kernel of L. It's just another way of saying find the kernel of L, right? And the kernel, remember this from chapter six. This is really great. This is where like the linear algebra and differential equations are starting to really, really mesh together, right? In chapter six, we saw that the kernel of L is a subspace, right? It forms a subspace. It's closed under addition and scalar multiplication. So it has a basis. It has a dimension, right? So everything that we said about the kernel of a linear transformation back in chapter six applies to this associated homogeneous differential equation. The solutions to this equation forms a subspace. It has a basis, it has a dimension, all that good stuff. Let's state that as a theorem and then we're gonna do a, an example or two to illustrate it, okay? So let me come back up here and I'm gonna try to state this very, very simple but powerful theorem that we're gonna uh, be taking advantage of. So let me put this up here in the top left. So theorem, okay, this is not something that you're gonna need to worry about proving or anything, but I want you to just know this fact, okay? So um, the set of solutions, the set of solutions, to L of Y equals zero, if we have a zero on the right hand side, forms a vector space.
Okay, in other words, it's the kernel of L, right? The solutions to that equation over there is the kernel of L. The kernel of L is definitely a vector space or subspace, whichever word you want to use, right? It forms a vector space and a little bit more, uh, this is of dimension n, it's of dimension n, where, what is n? Well, the n comes from looking at what L is. So L is, let's just say, a naught times d to the n plus, I'm going to put in quotes here, lower terms. In other words, the d to the n is the highest power of d in the operator. Okay, so the solutions to this, this is just a differential equation, right? Right down here. This is just a differential equation, L of y equals zero. The solutions to it form a vector space. And we even know the dimension of that vector space, right? So the whole uh, goal that we're going to have is going to be to find a basis for that vector space, right? This is going to be this is going to be how we're going to do this, okay? Let me give you a couple of examples, okay? By the way, for the rest of today, for the rest of today, all of our differential equations are going to be set equal to zero. When we come back on Thursday, this is my little cliffhanger to get you to come back on Thursday. On Thursday, I'm going to go back and put capital F over here again on the right side. And we'll talk on Thursday about how you handle solving differential equations that are not homogeneous, that do not have a zero here, okay? But for today, for the whole class today, the rest of today, this is always going to be equal zero. And that's what section 8.1 and 8.2 are concerned with. Okay, so let me show you an example now. a little more trouble erasing this today for some reason. I don't know, maybe it's the marker I'm using. Okay, so here's an example. Here's an example. Um, solve y double prime plus y equals zero. Okay. <laughs> now, um, what I'm going to do to sort of start this off, to put it into the context of my theorem, is I'm going to write down the operator form of this equation, right? So for the solution, I'm going to start with the operator form. Now, how, does that, how is that going to look? So remember, there's going to be something here that's called L, and then of Y equals zero. Okay, and what goes into these parentheses is just the derivative operator that corresponds to the left side of my equation. And I can see that what I have here is two derivatives. So that's going to be d squared. And then plus, well, this is no derivatives times y. So this is just going to be plus one times y. So the operator form of the equation is right here. And this is L d squared plus 1 is what L is. And notice that the n value, looking back at the notation for L, the n value is 2. So what my theorem tells me about this problem is that the solutions to this differential equation forms a two-dimensional vector space. So instead of searching far and wide, on and on and on and on and on, trying to find solutions to this differential equation, the power of my theorem is that I just have to find two basis vectors. I have to find two solutions to this differential equation. I'll tell you right now, guys, this differential equation has infinitely many solutions. You're not going to write them all down, right? You're not going to one by one go find them. But what we're going to do is we're going to find two solutions that form a basis. And that's a manageable task. So we're thinking in our minds, 
can we think of a function from calculus where if you take two derivatives of that function and then add that function back again, it cancels out. So can you think of a function that after you take two derivatives of it, you basically have the negative of what you started with? Just something from calculus when you were playing around learning, learning basic derivatives, right? I see, an, I see a proposal in the Zoom chat and it's absolutely right, sine of x, right? Sine of x is a solution. If you take two derivatives of sine of x, you'll get negative sine of x. And when you add that to sine of x again, it cancels to zero. So we have, we have solutions. Let me write that one down. Y1 of x equals sine of x. Okay. Now, um, can anybody besides Brendan think of another solution to that same differential equation where you take two derivatives and it's the negative of what you started with? It's very similar. Instead of sine of x, is there something else that you can take two derivatives of that you'll end up with the negative of what you started with? Yeah, uh, I, see, I see a suggestion here, cosine of x. And um, Matt, I noticed you put a minus sign in front of that cosine. Um, that's not wrong. Uh, but you don't need it right here. Just regular cosine of x will work. So I'm going to just write down y2 of x equals cosine of x like that. Now, guys, there are, there, those are two solutions. And are they linearly independent? They are linearly independent because why is that? It's because they're not multiples of each other. You cannot take sine of x and multiply it by a number and get cosine of x. Even if you just think about the graphs of sine of x and cosine of x, right? They're just shifted versions of each other. They're not multiples of each other. Since they're not multiples of each other and there's two vectors there, they are li. So we have two linearly independent solutions. Okay, so uh, note that y1, y2 as a set is Li, right? So y1 and y2 as a set is Li. And because the dimension is 2, right? The theorem says that the dimension of this is 2. And I have two vectors that are Li, right? This is just all linear algebra, isn't it? right? We have two linearly independent vectors in a two-dimensional space, so they are a basis, right? Okay, so um, since the solution space, I'll call it a solution space here, since the solution space has dimension two, since the solution space has dimension two, this means that y1 and y2 is a basis. We have two linearly independent solutions. Okay. Now guys, What's cool about this is not so much that sine of x and cosine of x are solutions. We already, anybody who's taken calculus could probably figure that out. What's cool about this is that your basis is a spanning set for all of the solutions, right? A basis is linearly independent and a spanning set. So what we're saying down here at the very end is that y1 and y2 is linearly independent, we already knew that, but it's also a spanning set for the whole solution space. So the cool thing is that thus, thus every solution 
to y double prime plus y equals zero has the form. So let's just think about what the form would be. When we're talking about spanning set, we're talking about linear combinations of these vectors, right? So we can write the form as, you know, C1 times the first vector, which was sine of x, plus C2 times cosine of x. And that is the general solution to this differential equation. It has two constants in it because it's second order. And this is the powerful thing. Up here at the top, every solution expresses itself this way. You might be wondering, okay, how do I know that, you know, some crazy combination of natural logs or radicals or rational expressions or something like that, how do I know there isn't some weird solution to this equation that has some mystifying combination of functions that somehow the second derivative of it, right, cancels out the original function? This result at the top says, no, 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 that cannot happen. You don't have to keep searching and searching for more and more and more solutions to this, to this equation. They're all right here, right? This is as excited as I could get through remote teaching, <laughs> right? I'm trying my best because this is, a, this is a highlight of what linear algebra is helping us to do. Not just to find two solutions to the equation. No, that's not the exciting part. The exciting part is that once I found the two solutions here, I actually found all of the solutions. They're all right there. So that's really, that's really pretty cool. Are there any questions about that? So this is the general solution. So you just choose numbers for C1 and C2, and you've got yourself a solution. Okay, it's any linear combination of sine and cosine. Now, some of you might be worried or wondering a little bit, well, what if you didn't think of sine of x or cosine of x and it just didn't come to you? Like, what would you do? Turns out that a little bit later today, there is a foolproof approach to ensuring that you actually do come up with these solutions. You don't have to get creative and happen to sort of glance at something and come up with an answer. Luckily, uh, Brendan and Matt helped us come up with these two functions. But if, if we didn't think of those functions, there's a foolproof way to get it right. And I'll be talking about that in just a little bit today, okay? All right, I wanna talk about one other thing first before I get into sort of how you really go about solving these equations if you don't just happen to eyeball the solution. So let me erase as best I can on the board here. I hope everybody's hanging in there okay. Just let me know if you have any questions. You know, to, to be honest with you, uh, most people, when they take Math 250B, uh, they like chapter eight. You might notice that we don't have a lot of vectors here. We don't have a lot of matrices here. Uh, you know, it, it's a little bit more scalar driven. So chapter eight is a is sort of a, a, at least briefly, is a sort of a break from some of that stuff. Well, as soon as I say that, of course, I'm about to show you a matrix. <laughs> um, so here's the deal. Sine of x and cosine of x were obviously linearly independent in this example, right? The two functions, y1 and y2, they were not scalar multiples of each other. But what if I had more functions? What if I had a higher order differential equation? We need to be able to decide if those functions are linearly independent if we wanna be able to use this same theory that we did on that last example, okay? So let me, let me do this. I'm going to uh, pose a question here. And uh, here's, my, here's the question, okay? The question is the following. Given n solutions, let me call them uh, y1, 
y2 dot 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 up to yn to L of y equals zero. So if I have n solutions to my differential equation, how can we tell? How can we tell if that set y1 dot 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 up to yn is li? How can I tell if, if my functions are li? Remember, if you have a lot of functions, you can't just use the scalar multiples reasoning. That last example, we just used uh, the fact that sine of x and cosine of x were not scalar multiples of each other. But what if we had n functions here? Well, the answer is that there is a tool called the Ronskian. It's called the Ronsky and starts with a W, right? Um, for those of you who really read the textbook closely, uh, you might have noticed that the Ronsky and was actually talked about back in chapter four. Chapter four was where, was where we were learning about linear independence. And in most of those examples in chapter four, what I told you to do is to just put your vectors into the columns of a matrix, right? Augment it with a column of zeros, row reduce it, and then make sure that there are no free variables. So we did it all in terms of matrices before. But if I had n functions, if I had n functions, how would I like put those functions into, how would I put sine of x and cosine of x into a matrix, right? It doesn't really make sense to me. Well, the Ronskian is what is going to make it make sense. Okay, so let me define this Ronskian for you. Okay, so by definition, uh, I'm going to use a W for the Ronskian, which is going to be a function of all of my y1 through yn. Okay, so we take W of y1 through yn. And what it is, is the following. We are going to use a matrix here. We're going to take the determinant of the matrix, <coughs> excuse me, we're going to take the determinant of the matrix where we put our functions y1, y2, and so on across the top row. So this is a matrix that has functions in it, right? Functions of x inside of it. So we put our functions across that top row. And here's what you're going to do. To fill out the rest of this matrix, you're just going to take derivatives right down the matrix. So you're going to do the second row is going to be y1 prime, y2 prime, dot, 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 yn prime. That's the second row. And you keep going like that. I'll put dot, dot, dots vertical here. How long do you keep doing this? Well, it's very easy. You do it until the matrix has a square size. You can't take the determinant of something if it's not square. So you just take enough derivatives that it becomes a square size. So the last row would actually end up being y1 with n minus 1 derivatives, and then y2 with n minus 1 derivatives, all the way over to yn with n minus 1 derivatives. <coughs> Okay, I hope you can read that okay. So this is the, this is the Ronskian. And you're going to take this determinant of this matrix. And the theorem, the theorem, which is actually in a group, so the, the, the justification of this theorem is in a group work that uh, we may get to uh, maybe on Thursday. Uh, but for now, I'm just going to state it. And it just says, if there is a value of x, say x naught. So if there is some number that you can plug in for x such that 
the wrong skin of your functions, y1, y2, dot, 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 up to yn of x naught is not zero. So if you can, keep in mind, by the way, this matrix over here has tons of x's in it. These are all functions in here. So you've got a whole big expression involving x. If you can plug a number in for x, let's call it x naught, and get a non-zero answer, right? So it's just literally plugging it in. It's just an exercise to plug it in. Then, then if you can do that, then y1, y2, dot, 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 up to yn is li. So in that case, your functions are li. This is the test, this Ronskian test for linear independence. You have to have a linearly independent set to get a basis. Okay, so let me just slide that back a slight bit there. Okay, let me uh, do an example up here, sort of show you what I'm, what I'm talking about. Okay, so this is just a quick example to practice the Ronskian, and then we're gonna spend the rest of today solving tons of differential equations that we never knew how to solve before. It's gonna be great. Okay, so just a quick example of this first. Uh, let's just, maybe, maybe, in fact, maybe two examples. Let's just do a quick example. Uh, the first one, let's go back to uh, sine of x and cosine of x the one that we were looking at earlier. Let's just take the Ronskian of those two functions and see what happens, okay? So if we do the Ronskian, I'm just gonna say, I'm just gonna call that W of X right here. This is just the determinant of, so what matrix do I have to write down? I have to put my functions on the top row, so sine of X, cosine of X, and then, as I work my way down the matrix, I take derivatives. So in the first column, the derivative of sine of x is going to be cosine of x. And in the second column, the derivative of cosine of x, this is cosine, sorry. The derivative of cosine of x is negative sine of x. So this is the Ronskian matrix, and we're gonna take the determinant here, okay? This is just a two by two, so we can use the, you know, the A, D minus B, C formula, right, that we learned way back when. So when I do that, I'm just going to get negative sine squared of X minus cosine squared of X, right? Negative sine squared minus cosine squared, which of course is just negative one. All right, well, no matter what, <laughs> no matter what, that's not zero, right? Look at the condition at the bottom here. As long as you can plug in a number for X and get a non-zero answer, your functions are Li. In this case, no matter what you plug in for X, makes no difference. The Ronskian is always just equal to negative one. There's nothing else you have to say about it. Okay. Hopefully so far so good. Uh, let me do maybe one more example of this uh, idea. Let's do a second example. Maybe I'll do a, uh, I'll do a three by three matrix maybe, okay. So let's do one more example here. Um, let's take the function um, let me just think what I want to do. Let's take, um, let's take uh, 2x minus 5 and um, x squared plus 1 and x squared plus 2x minus 4. Okay, let me get out of the way, let you copy that down. Let's take these three functions. 2x minus five, x squared plus one, and x squared plus two x minus four. 
okay? Let's see if these are linearly independent using our Ronskian trick. By the way, these are just polynomials. So you could, of course, go back to chapter four, lay those polynomials into the columns of a matrix and do it the old way. You certainly can for this example. Can't really do it the old way up here, okay? Sine of x and cosine of x, I don't know how to you know, make columns out of those. But for polynomials, I could. But let's just do the Ronskian uh, check on this one as well. So um, by the way, I'm sorry. The, the conclusion up here is that these, th this set is Li, right? So now on this one, if we do the Ronskian of x, it's going to be a determinant of three by three size this time. It's three by three because I have three functions here. And what I'm going to do is lay my functions in the first row, 2x minus 5, x squared plus 1, and x squared plus 2x minus 4. So I just put the functions right there in the first row. And now I just start taking derivatives down the matrix. Okay, so the derivative of 2x minus 5 is just 2. The derivative of x squared plus 1 is 2x. And the derivative of x squared plus 2x minus 4 is just 2x plus 2. Okay. Finally, I take one more derivative because I have to make a square matrix, so it has to be 3 by 3, right? So I take one more derivative. The bottom row is just 0, 2, and 2. Okay. You've got a couple of choices right now. You can um, use the arrow method on this to find the determinant expression, or you can just gamble that you can find a value of x, you know, pick some number out of a hat and find a value of x that's going to work. Um, the trouble is if you pick a specific x, let's say we tried something, if we evaluate at x equals zero, for example, which is the easiest number to plug in. If you just try plugging in zero here, well, what's going to happen is you're going to get negative 5, 1, negative 4, 2, 0, 2, and 0, 2, 2. So you're going to get that matrix right there. If you plug in zero everywhere you see an x, that's what it's going to come out to. And you can now just say, well, I'm going to take the determinant of this matrix that has numbers in it. This is just all numbers now, right? Because I've replaced x with 0. If this determinant is not 0, we win, right? If, if any time we plug a number in for x, we get a non-zero number. We only have to get it one time to come out to a non-zero number. Then the functions are li. The problem with this one is that if you actually do this determinant, it turns out that this determinant is equal to zero. Bad luck, right? <laughs> it didn't work out. You can check that with the arrow method or cofactor expansion, whatever way you want, that determinant is zero. Okay, so you might say, all right, maybe I picked a bad choice for x. What if I chose x equal to one? So I could do that. I could say, well, I'll try a different number. I could try a different number here. I could try to put in a one for x. I don't have a lot of room here. Let me just, if I put in one for x, I'll get negative three, two, negative one, and two, two, four, and zero, two, two. So I could say, okay, here's a different matrix. Maybe this one has a non-zero determinant. Again, if it does, we win. We found a value of x that gave us a non-zero determinant. Well, I don't want to steal your fun, but I'm going to. It turns out this determinant is also zero. We got unlucky again. Now, it's possible that we could just be getting unlucky, but it's also possible that no matter what number we try to put in for x, we're going to keep getting zero. How long are we supposed to put up with this, right? At some point, after we've tried maybe two, three, or four values of x, 
and if we keep losing, right, we keep getting zero every time, we might start to suspect that, huh, I wonder if maybe this isn't going to work. And if we start to suspect that, then what we should do, what we should do, if we start to suspect that there isn't going to be an X that's going to work, is we should convince ourselves that we're right, that there will never be an X that works. And to do that, we need to leave the X's in the matrix and just do the determinant in terms of X. So let me just do it real quick. I'm gonna do the arrow method. So I'm gonna take the first main diagonal. Uh, it's two times two X, which is four X times two X minus five, right? The next diagonal over is actually going to be a zero. And the next diagonal over is going to be four times X squared plus two X minus four. Okay, and then I have to start subtracting some diagonals. So I'm going to have a minus zero for this diagonal here. The next diagonal is going to be two times two X plus two times two X minus five. And the last diagonal is going to be four times the quantity X squared plus one. So this is doing the arrow method with the X's still in there. And you can also do cofactor expansion. That would be fine. Um, because it's a three by three, I decided to just use the arrow method. I'm gonna save you a little bit of messy algebra here, guys, and just tell you that unfortunately, when you simplify this whole thing, everything cancels, okay? Even when you leave all the X's in here, this whole thing is going to completely cancel out to zero. It means that no matter what X is, we're not going to get a non-zero number. It means that thus this set is LD. In this case, the set is LD. Actually, maybe some of you already realized what I did here to create my polynomials. I don't know if you noticed this, but the third polynomial is just the first two added together. <laughs> There's not much an easier way to make a linear dependency than that, right? So I just took the first two polynomials, which cost me $2,000, and I added them together and paid another $1,000 for this polynomial, which is already dependent on the first two. So these, these vectors, in this case, this is LD. Okay, so this is LD. Okay, are there any questions about that, that Ronskin check? In theory, if I give you a differential equation and you solve it, you would need to check that your solutions are LD, or sorry, that your solutions are LI so that you can have a basis. Right, this is the whole idea is to come up with a basis like we did on the first example. This was good up here, right? Sine of X, cosine of X, it was a basis. So all of our solutions to our differential equation could be written down as a linear combination. But if you have a linearly dependent set, then you're a long way from what you want, right? You don't have a basis, so you don't know how to express everything as a linear combination, right? You still have work to do if this sort of thing happens, okay? Remember, LI is a good thing, LD is a bad thing. <laughs> okay, what I wanna do next is, I wanna take a, just about, a, let's take about a, a five minute break. Uh, if you need to go run to the restroom, grab some water or anything like that. When we come back, uh, I'm gonna cover, or try to cover section 8.2 um, and Again, I don't know if I'm going to have time to answer a lot of homework questions. I'll try at the end if I can get through the material that I need for you guys to do the homework. I'll do that. But let's take a five minute break right now so I can rest my voice. You guys can take a quick little break as well. And then we'll start 8.2, okay? All right, great. I'll be back with you in just a minute.
Okay, guys, I think I'll go ahead and, um, and get started again here. Um, hopefully everything was good. Does anybody have any questions from the sort of that first half of today's talk at all? A lot of what that was, was just kind of the theoretical background. That was section 8.1, the stuff we were doing in this first part of today. How do you um, make sure that your functions are linearly independent? Uh, we use the Ronsky in for that. Um, what's the dimension of my solution space supposed to be? And it's just the order of whatever the differential equation is, right? And so there's a lot of sort of linear algebra behind the scenes there. We're trying to find the kernel of L. In fact, that's what I wrote here. We want to solve for L of Y equals zero. It just means we want to find the kernel. In fact, let me just make that more clear. We want to solve L of Y equals zero for Y, right? The unknown function, as always, is just Y itself. So we're trying to, we're trying to find the kernel of L. That's the idea. In this section 8.2, we're actually going to start doing it we're actually going to start figuring out how to write down the solution. It turns out this section is one of the easiest in the whole entire class, but it's a little bit, it still takes a while to, to go through it because there's like several different cases that we have to look at. But from your point of view of learning the material, the concepts in this section are not too bad, okay? We're gonna get real specific. We're gonna take, an nth order linear constant coefficient homogeneous differential equation that is a mouthful of course the homogeneous part that just means we're going to have a zero on the right hand side of our equation okay remember until thursday we're going to keep this zero right here thursday i'll talk about what you do if you don't have a zero there okay but i'm going to assume that the a naught the a1 all the way up to a n, that those are constants. Okay, it says constant coefficient. If you have this type of differential equation, which by the way is very common in physics, engineering, all different types of engineering, right? The most common type of differential equation that you're gonna see in engineering is gonna be an nth order linear constant coefficient equation. It might not be homogeneous, but I'll address that on Thursday. Okay, so for now, it's going to be homogeneous as well. Homogeneous just means zero on the right side. Okay, so we would like to do this. How are we going to solve? How are we going to solve this? Okay, so the method of solution, the method to solve this is actually something that I don't like all that well. <laughs> But it is what it is, which is that we're going to guess the answer, <laughs> right? We're going to use we're going to use what is called a trial solution. This is often called a trial solution, and um, it turns out that somebody somebody a whole lot smarter than me and a whole long time ago like hundreds of years ago figured out what we can use as a guess something that would actually be plausible that we could guess would solve this system and the answer is the following e to the r x okay e to the r x this is very important right um now, this is going to be where R is to be determined, right? How are we going to determine what R is? Well, we're going to plug our guess into the differential equation and see what happens, right? See if there's anything we can say, okay? So let's just do that. Let's just literally plug it in. Let's take our guess, kind of pulling a rabbit out of a hat right now. I'm just gonna take a guess that this box is gonna be the right answer. I'm gonna plug it into the equation, the differential equation right above it. So what is it gonna give me? It's gonna give me A naught times N derivatives of Y, right? 
Well, n derivatives of e to the rx, if you think about taking derivatives of e to the rx, every derivative just pulls a constant of r out in front, right? So if I do n derivatives of e to the rx, I'm going to end up with r to the n times e to the rx in that first term. Okay, I'm just plugging it into the differential equation right at the top here. Okay, the next term, a1 r to the n minus 1 power times e to the rx. And we go dot, 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 we keep doing that. The very last term over here, a sub n times y, well, that's just a sub n times e to the rx. And all of this is equal to zero. So I literally plugged my boxed guess, my trial solution, into the nth order linear constant coefficient homogeneous differential equation. Now, what you'll notice at the bottom here, every single term has an e to the rx in it, right? So you can actually factor that out. e to the rx can be factored out, leaving me with a naught r to the n, plus a1 r to the n minus 1, plus dot, 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 all the way up to a sub n, and all of that is still equal to 0. So you just factor the e to the rx out. I'm sure you probably remember from your uh, algebra classes in high school, e to the rx is never 0. It can be canceled. It is never going to be 0. So what you are left with in these brackets is an equation that you can solve for r, right? This is, this is actually something called the auxiliary equation. This is called the auxiliary equation. It's not that different from what we were looking at last week when we had lambdas there, <laughs> right? The characteristic equation. It was like an nth degree polynomial. The auxiliary equation is the same way and what we can do is we can solve for r. We can solve that for r. Now, this is a polynomial of degree n. So there will be n solutions for r. And that's exactly how many we need. Remember that this is an nth order differential equation. So at, if I look at the kernel of L, it will be an n-dimensional vector space. This means I need n linearly independent basis vectors. And each of my r values is going to give me a function that can be one of those vectors. OK, let's try an example. This is, this is all there is to it. And by the way, the other thing is, do you notice? Look back at the original differential equation here. And look at the auxiliary equation. All you have to do is take this equation up here, the operator form of your, of your differential equation, and replace the d's with r's. That's actually all that happens. You don't have to rederive this every time. You don't have to plug it in every time. Now that we've done it once together right here on the board, you know what's going to happen. The capital d's are all going to turn into r's. So you can go straight to that step, right? This is why Thursday's homework will hopefully go pretty smoothly. There's not that much. You just take the equation, convert the d's to r's. Now you have to solve this equation. Sometimes it can be hard to factor something, but that's kind of a high school issue. That's not really a math 250b issue so much. You have to trust, trust that I'm going to give you problems that are not horrifically bad to factor, right? Because that's not really what I'm here to to teach you guys about. So yeah, so let's just try an example and see how this works out. Okay, so let's try an example here. Here it is, example. Okay, find the general solution Find the general solution to d minus 2 
times the quantity d squared minus 16 of y is equal to zero. Let's see if we can solve that. By the way, uh, you know, this, this operator here, in this case, it's already been given to you in a factored form. If, if it wasn't, it, they might have given it to you something like this. This would have been, you know, the actual operator. This would be the actual operator. If you like multiplied this D thing out, you'd get this. Okay, but if they had given it to you this way, you would have had to struggle to factor the auxiliary equation. So they're being uh, kind of nice to you on this example by already sort of partly factoring it. It's not fully factored, but it is partially factored. Okay, so um, what we're gonna do for the solution here, the very first thing you wanna do, guys, is just write down the auxiliary equation. Okay, so the auxiliary equation What is it? Remember that all you have to do is change all of the D's to R's. There is the auxiliary equation. All, oops, that should be a minus, R squared minus 16. Okay, so that is your auxiliary equation. You just, as we showed right down here on the bottom of the, of the board, all of the D's just change to R's. And we have to now solve for r, right? So if you look at that, we get, well, the first factor, r minus two, corresponds with r equal to two. And I think everybody can probably factor r squared minus 16. The answer is plus or minus four. So we get three values of r, which means we can make three functions of this form now that will work. In other words, our guess, our trial solution is working as long as we use these values of R right here. Okay, so let me actually write that down now. Okay, so what we're saying is we get, I'm gonna make a little, uh, a little list here, Y1 of X, this would be uh, E to the 2X, Y2 of X, would be e to the 4x and y3 of x would be e to the negative 4x. Okay. Let me give myself some room to say a little bit more down here on the bottom. Okay, so far so good. Feel free to ask questions. You can uh, jump into the chat and uh, type something in or you can unmute yourself and uh, speak up if there's any question. But uh, what, what you're seeing on the first half of the board is really what a lot of section 8.2 is about. You have a differential equation that you wanna solve. You just simply have to write down the auxiliary equation and find the roots and then put down the solutions. Now, the Professor? Yes, question. Was there a question? Can you hear me? Uh, can't quite hear you. No, if the, the R we chose, or the E to the RX is yeah. working or not? I'm sorry, I didn't quite catch that. The R that we chose in the E to the RX, what was the question? If we cho choose E the RX or say something else besides that, is there a point where we'll okay. know if it's working or not? Okay, so we're not going to choose anything else besides that. <laughs> okay, when we have an nth order constant coefficient linear homogeneous differential equation, in other words, when we're in section 8.2, we will always choose our trial solution to be E to the RX and we will always go through this process. Now the thing is, there are other types of differential equations. There's Cauchy-Euler equations, there's equations that don't have constant coefficients, 
Um, there's equations that you use, something called reduction of order. There's a lot of other techniques, and some of them are discussed in the, in the book. We're not going to go into any of those things. So for your purposes, this is all that you need to know at this point. We're going to guess e to the rx. We're going to solve our auxiliary equation and write down our answers. It's just that fast. Okay. Now, if you look at this differential equation, what is the order of this differential equation? What's the most derivatives that you would have to take if you were going to actually you know, write out the uh, left side using derivative notation? What's the order of that differential equation? Can somebody type it into the chat or just tell me what it is? The third. Yeah, it's third order, isn't it? Because if you take the d times the d squared, if you foil this out on the left, if you foil that out, you'll get a d cubed, won't you? You'll get d cubed. So if you get d cubed, that means three derivatives. So this is a third order differential equation. So remember that my solution space is three dimensional. Well, how lovely is that? We have three solutions right here, right? <laughs> Okay, so the point is that the general solution, we can go, we can write down the answer immediately. The general solution is y of x equals, right, these guys are going to be your basis. So c1 e to the 2x plus c2 e to the 4x plus c3 e to the negative 4x. You really don't have to show a massive amount of work in this section. You can kind of just go straight to writing down the answers. Now, you might be a little nervous. This would be reasonable. You might be a little nervous. What if these functions are LD? <laughs> we just got through talking about this, right? We need our functions to be a basis, which means they have to be LI. So there is a group work problem that we'll probably do on Thursday, which actually shows that as long as you get three different roots over here, as long as your roots are all distinct, the Ronskian that you would make out of those functions is always going to be non-zero, okay? So you won't have to work. The Ronskian test that we talked about if you take the determinant of that matrix that you get by putting your functions on the top row and then differentiating it down as you go down the matrix and taking the determinant of that, it will always be non-zero in this context where you have three different R values, okay? So I'm not going to stop right now and calculate the Ronskin, and you guys shouldn't feel like you have to do that on the homework either you can just immediately go, as I did here, straight to the general solution. It turns out that the, the linear independence of the solutions in this section really turns into a non-issue. You're never really going to need to use that Ronskian here. I wanted you to know about it because it is part of the theory of differential equations and testing for linear independence. But are you going to be needing to do it on every single problem, write out the Ronskian of everything you always derive and figure out that it's not zero? No, you won't have to do nearly that much work. So this is really the full solution, okay? Let's do one more example. Um, and then I'm gonna talk about, so there are some issues, by the way. I just haven't gotten to them yet. There are some issues with this. It's not, this one's really simple but that there, there can be some problems that come up. So let me do another example. I'm gonna just write the question down here at the bottom. Um, find the general solution to uh, y triple prime minus y double prime minus 30y prime equals zero. Okay, let you guys copy that down while I make some room here to solve it.
Okay, so um, I guess the only real difference from this example to the previous one is that this one is not written in the operator form. So the very first thing that you should do here is rewrite the equation using the operators. In other words, using the, the D notation, right? So I'm gonna, when I solve this, the only thing I have to do is kind of an extra step here is I have to use the derivative operator. So I'm gonna put my, my notation like this. I've got a zero on the right side. I've got Y as my unknown function that I'm solving for. And now I'm gonna look at the, the left side of my equation here and see what kind of derivatives I have. I have d cubed here, right? Y triple prime, so that would be d cubed of y minus d squared of y, and then minus 30d. Okay, so this is your, you know, this is what I was calling L earlier, right? That's your uh, operator. And once you have that, you can immediately write down the auxiliary equation. Remember that that just amounts to changing all of the d's to r's. So you'll just get r cubed minus r squared minus 30r equals zero. So all of the d's turn into r's, and now we just have to hope we can factor this one. <laughs> okay, this one is not too hard to factor because you can pull out an r from all three terms and leave yourself with something that's just a quadratic equation. Uh, so if I now factor this quadratic, it's pretty easy. It's just r minus 6 times r plus 5. So we just factor that thing pretty easily. And the values of r that we have would be 0, 6, and negative 5. OK, so I can write down the answer now. The general solution I'm going pretty fast, uh, but please do feel free to ask me a question if there's anything that you're not comfortable with here. The, the general solution is just going to be y of x equals c1 times e to the 0. Well, e to the 0 is just 1, so I don't have to write anything else. So it's just c1 plus c2 e to the 6x plus c3 e to the negative 5x. Okay, so there's the answer. A couple of a couple of really quick quick examples here. So far, so good. Before I get into what's hard about this, because there is an issue that we're going to have to deal with, and I'm just going to um, try to explain that here in the next uh, few minutes. So far, so good. Okay, great. There are actually. I mean, this seems pretty easy. This seems pretty easy, but there are two issues that can come up. Some of you might have already thought about this. What would happen, what would happen, the first issue, what would happen if one of my roots got repeated? Remember, this was kind of a headache with the uh, eigenvalues as well. <laughs> if some eigenvalue didn't pull its weight, then we had a defective matrix, right? All that stuff from chapter seven. Same issue here. What about repeated roots? So I'll address that in a second. The second issue is that all right, maybe the roots aren't repeated, but what if they are complex numbers? So you could get complex roots here. So I need to explain how to handle repeated roots and complex roots. So let me come back up to the top and I'll do that. And then actually there's an even worse scenario, which is what if you have both of these problems at the same time, <laughs> right? You could have complex roots that actually get repeated and that can be an issue. But let me just take it one thing at a time here. Let's look at the first issue first, repeated roots. It turns out this is pretty easy to address. This one is not, is not too bad. So if a root 
if a root r is repeated, let's say, k times, so let's suppose you have a root r that gets repeated, let's say, k times, then We can't, just, we can't just keep writing down the same term in our solution k times. That's not going to be linearly independent. But we can get k linearly independent solutions by just doing a slight little tweak. Okay, so let me tell you what that tweak is. So we get k linearly independent solutions and the way we get them is the following. So um, the first one is, of course, you're just going to write down, you know, y1 of x is just e to the rx. That's the original trial solution that was our guess that we had. Okay. But then what are you going to do for the second solution? Now that you've had a repeated root, you can't just write e to the rx again. So it turns out that mathematicians have figured out, again, it wasn't me, and it happened a long time before I was ever born, but mathematicians figured out <laughs> that there's a way to tweak this first solution, and that is to put an x in front of the e to the rx. Let me be clear that this is not a scalar multiple of the first one. The x is not a scalar, right? x is actually a variable. So these are linearly independent, and I'm not going to take the time to verify it, but this new solution will still work in the differential equation, okay? The third solution is just going to be y3 of x equals r, uh, sorry, x, that should be an x, uh, x squared e to the rx. And you just keep going like this all the way until you get to the kth repeat and y sub k of x is just going to be x to the k minus 1 times e to the rx. That is the pattern. So if you have a root to your auxiliary equation that repeats a bunch of times, this is how you handle it. It's very easy. You just stack x's. This is the way I will be saying it. You stack those x's in front of the e to the rx, and you do it as many times as whatever k is, the, the number of terms that you, that you need that correspond to that root. So that's pretty easy. That's pretty easy, okay? So if we get repeated roots, no problem, okay? So let me go on to the second issue. Suppose that your root Suppose that your root is a complex number. Let's suppose we get a plus bi, and I'm just going to assume that b is not zero here. For example, maybe you solve the quadratic equation and, you know, b squared minus 4ac is less than zero, right? So you get some imaginary numbers for the roots of your equation. The same thing happens sometimes on your eigenvalues, right? For a matrix, you could get imaginary eigenvalues, and it's a little bit of a headache. Same thing here. If we get imaginary numbers, we're going to have to work a little bit harder. The first thing I'm going to say is, if this is a root, um, then if a plus b i is a root, then it turns out that Complex roots always come in conjugate pairs. So, you know, we saw that with the eigenvalues as well. If we have, uh, you know, lambda equals 4 plus 3i, we'll also have to have lambda equals 4 minus 3i. So they're always going to come in pairs like this. But the problem is, and I'm sure you guys can kind of see this, you don't need to write this down. I just want to show you what it looks like on the board here. Like, if this was supposed to be like, if this was supposed to be my solution down here, e to the rx, I wouldn't have the first clue how to even graph that. 
how do you take E and raise it to an imaginary power? This is not something that engineers are going to be very happy about, right? You don't have real solutions that you can, you know, plot, you know, Y as a function of X, the way you could plot some of these up here, right? This is something that mathematicians do talk about exponentiating with imaginary numbers, but it's not something from a practical point of view that an engineer is gonna be happy with. So what we are gonna do <laughs> is we are going to not write this down as our answer. Instead, it turns out that you can extract two real solutions from this pair of eigenvalues, uh, sorry, a pair of, of roots, okay? These aren't eigenvalues, I don't know why I'm saying that. These are a conjugate complex pair of roots to the auxiliary equation. And for those two roots, we're gonna make two real solutions. So instead of one for one, it's kind of two for two, right? We have two roots, which is a complex conjugate pair, and we're gonna write down two real solutions. And what are they, right? We get, let me write it down. I'm gonna go ahead and erase this phony thing that doesn't work. Okay, so please don't ever write e to the power of a plus or minus bi, right? That's not going to be an answer that anybody's going to be happy with. So what, we, what we're going to do is we get two linearly independent solutions. Normally, I would derive this whole thing for you, but at the moment, I don't think I'm going to just because I'm... Um, dealing with this uh, virtual learning thing, it's a little tougher for me. I'm just gonna jump to the punchline. So the two solutions, I'm gonna call them Y1 and Y2. And here's what they are. E to the AX times cosine of BX and E to the AX times sine of BX. Okay, there's no I in either of those solutions. If I have time later, I'll show you how you can actually derive these two solutions from the two roots. But for right now, for your purposes, what you're going to have to be able to do for the homework and the exams and everything else, this is where the rubber hits the road. This is what you actually need to be able to do. So the A and the B the real and imaginary parts of the, of the root are showing up uh, in the answer here. The A comes up in the exponential piece and the B comes up in the sine and the cosine. Okay, so that's exactly uh, how, this, how this works. I'd like to do a couple of quick examples, okay? So let's do a couple of examples where we have some repeats and where we have some uh, complex numbers involved. So here's an example right here. I'll call this one example one. Solve, solve d squared plus four quantity cubed, I'm sorry, quantity squared times the quantity d plus one cubed of y equals zero. Okay. When I say solve, I just mean find the general solution, right? That's really what we're looking for here. Let's try to find the general solution. Okay, so the solution, I'll start right here. What we need to do is find the corresponding auxiliary equation, right? The first step, just change all of the D's to R's. It's the same thing we were doing before. So we're just gonna do that again right here. We're gonna get the auxiliary equation. And what is it? Well, it's going to be R squared plus four squared times R plus one cubed equals zero. Okay, so all of the d's just get changed into r's. And now the question is, well, what are the roots? So we have to solve those for r. 
Um, if we look at the first factor, r squared plus four, uh, r is really going to be the square root of negative four, which is just plus or minus two i, right? The, the roots of r squared plus four is just plus and minus two i, but notice that it's being squared, which means that plus and minus two i should be written down twice. Remember when you had eigenvalues that would repeat? I asked you guys to make sure to write down the repeats every time so you can keep track of the multiplicity. We need to do that same thing here. So I'm gonna write down plus and minus 2i, plus and minus 2i, okay? By the way, if you weren't sure how I got plus and minus 2i, you can also just use the quadratic formula on this uh, quadratic equation and solve for the roots. Make sure you know that quadratic formula, guys. You're gonna be using it a lot, okay? So those are the two roots. And then the second factor, r plus one cubed, that's pretty easy. The roots are just negative one, negative one, and negative one. So we write down all of the repeats. In total, how many roots do I have? I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven roots. That's great because the order of my differential equation, if you were to like expand out, take a look at your expansion of this expression here, right? What would be the most number of d's that you would have in a term? Well, I see a d squared squared, that's d to the fourth, and it's being multiplied by d cubed, d to the fourth times d cubed is d to the seventh. This is a seventh order differential equation, and we now have seven roots to our auxiliary equation. Granted, some of them are repeated and some of them are complex, but in total, we have seven roots. We can actually just go straight to writing down the final answer now. This is why this section is not a lot of hard work. You just write down the auxiliary equation, you write down your roots, and then you write down the answer. Let's do it. Y of X equals, there's gonna be seven terms. C1, let's look at the very first root plus and minus two i. Remember, they come two for two, right? So this is a pair of roots that's gonna give me two solutions, and down here in the lower right corner is how you get those solutions. When you have plus or minus two i, notice that the a, right, this a right here is just zero, and the b is just two. So we come to our solutions and we put in zero for a, and we put in two for b. So we're going to get e to the zero cosine of two x and e to the zero sine of two x. So my first term is cosine of two x times c1, and then I have another term, which is c2 times the sine of two x. Those are the first two terms. There's gonna be seven terms total. Now the next roots are repeated, but they're the same, right? That's plus and minus two i. So remember how we handle repeats. We stack those x's in front of the functions. So for the next term, I'm going to have c3 times x times cosine of 2x, right? And then I'll come down here to continue. The next one would be c4 times x times the sine of 2x. I want to point out that this x here does not need to be x squared yet. Okay, because I know that I know I stacked one x right there, and I'm only stacking one x right here. That's just because, you know, we're not repeating sine of x over and over again. It's switching between sines and cosines. So the x only stacks once here and once here. If the plus and minus two i had shown up a third time as a pair, then we would have had two more terms that would have had those x squareds in them. Okay. What about the rest of the terms for this solution? Well, I have negative one, negative one, and negative one. So that's gonna be C5 e to the negative x plus C6 x e to the negative x plus C7 x squared e to the negative x. That's the final answer. It takes almost as much writing to put down the final answer as it did to just 
do the rest of the problem. <laughs> so so the, the answer takes as much time as anything. Any questions on that example? I'm gonna do one more to practice a little bit and then we'll then I'm just about getting to the end of what I need to do today. But I wanna do another example just to be sure. We good so far? I've been known on, on my midterm or final before to have some, you know, like 14th order differential equation, right? And it takes like a lot to write out 14 terms. But as long as you can get the auxiliary equation and write down the roots, and as long as you know how to handle repeats and complex roots, it's not that bad. It's not that bad. Most of the students in the, in the past that have, have worked on this section didn't really, didn't really have too much of a hard time with it. So let's do another example. Okay, so let's do one more here. Example, let's solve d squared minus 6d plus 13 quantity cubed times d to the fourth of y equals zero. <laughs> okay. Let's take a look at that. Uh, I always like to kind of make sure we're on the, on the right page here. Let's think about the order of that differential equation. So if we actually like foiled out, I don't want you to do this, but if you actually foiled out the operator on the left side, what would be the most powers of D that you would see in one of those terms? Can somebody tell me? Uh, 13, Ryuko is a little too big. It's actually just 10 is the right answer, right? So if you take D squared and cube it, that's gonna be D to the sixth. And here we have a D to the fourth. If you take D to the sixth times D to the fourth, you get D to the 10th, right? That's okay. So this is just a 10th order differential equation. So guess how many terms our answer is going to have? 10, right? <laughs> There's gonna be 10 terms. We just have to find all the roots of the auxiliary equation. So I'm gonna go even a little bit faster this time. Uh, I'm just going to write down immediately, we have r squared minus 6r plus 13 cubed times r to the fourth equals zero. That is your auxiliary equation. Change all the d's to r's. Okay, now this quadratic here actually does not factor nicely. So we're going to need to use the quadratic formula on, the, on just on this little quadratic right here. So if I do that, r is going to be, you know, 6 plus or minus the square root of b squared would be 36 minus 4 times uh, 1 times 13 is 52, all over 2. Okay, so here comes some imaginary numbers again. 6 divided by 2 is 3. And then uh, this is a radical of negative 16. So the square root of negative 16 is just 4i. And 4i is being divided by 2. So this is going to give me 2i right here. OK. Um, so my roots, let's just write them all down. My roots are going to be 3 plus or minus 2i. 3 plus or minus 2i, and 3 plus or minus 2i, and then the r to the fourth gives me four zeros. So there's my big long list of all 10 of my roots. Okay, so let me now try to write down the answer. Okay, so y of x equals, okay, you ready for this? Here we go. Uh, the first root is three plus or minus two i. I'm just gonna use my two solutions right here. So I'm gonna get C1 e to the three x cosine of two x plus C2 e to the three x sine of two x. Okay, 
So we have that. I'm going to go ahead and erase these solutions that are listed here at the bottom. Okay. Um, we have eight more terms to go. If we were in the classroom right now, I would like call on like 10 of you <laughs> to tell me all of these terms. But just to keep this moving along, I'm just going to go ahead and continue. For the next pair of terms, I just have to stack x's because I'm repeating the same complex root. So I'll have c3x e to the 3x cosine of 2x plus c4 e to the 3x sine of 2x. Right? And then the next two terms, I'm repeating 3 plus or minus 2i again. So I'm going to get c5x squared e to the 3x cosine of 2x, and then c6 x squared e to the 3x sine of 2x. That takes care of the uh, repeated complex pairs. I forgot an x after c4. I sure did. Thank you, Ryuko. Uh, let me fix that right here. There should be a c4 and an x. Just making a few mistakes on purpose, guys, just to make sure you're still there. <laughs> okay, so I've got my six terms. Now, what about the last four terms? Well, I'm starting over with a new root, which is zero. So I'm gonna have C7 times E to the zero, okay? And then the next term is C8 times E to the zero, but I have to stack an X, right? So I'm starting over with my stacking process now that I have a new root, okay? And then C9 times x squared, and then C10 times x cubed. You just keep powering up those x's, stacking those x's term by term by term until you have repeated all of them. You've got all of them covered. So there's 10 terms. It's a 10-dimensional solution space, and we've got the whole thing written down. Just cleared everybody? Okay, I've got like two minutes left. I'm gonna do one thing uh, off topic. That's it for 8.2, guys, by the way. Uh, so I think you can do the homework on that for Thursday without too much trouble. I wanna mention something about one of the problems on the homework for, um, for, to, for today. Um, and then I'm going to stick around and see if there's a few other questions. But let me, let me uh, point out one quick thing here. OK, so this is, you know, uh, this is actually problem number uh, nine on section 7.2. So going to the, to, back to the homework. Um, they give you this matrix, and I just want to say something about this really fast. 3, 0, 0, 2, 0, negative 4, and 1, 4, 0. And they just, they're just asking you for the eigenvalues and eigenvectors. So, you know, you do the usual thing. You subtract the lambdas off of the main diagonal, and you get that you have a characteristic equation, which is 3 minus lambda, times lambda squared plus 16. So your lambda values are right here. Okay, so I'm just doing this kind of quickly because I want to make a quick point before some of you have to take off. These are the lambdas. Remember that with the plus and minus 4i, you don't have to do both positive and negative 4i. Stick with the positive one. Whenever this uh, pair of complex roots comes up on the eigenvalues, always focus on the positive one. This will become more clear why I'm telling you that when we get to chapter nine. But here's what I wanted to say about this example. Because somebody was asking me about the null space that you come up with here. If we subtract 4i from the main diagonal of this matrix, we get something fairly messy looking, which is right here. This is the null space that you have to calculate. And I've had a few people kind of asking me, uh, how are you supposed to work with that? 
here's the deal, guys. Remember, you can always cross off a row, right? Choose a bad row, choose a messy row if you can to cross off. I'm going to cross off, in this case, I'm just going to cross off the second row. I, I don't want to cross off the first row because the first row is relatively simple, right? So remember now, when you're solving this, it's actually pretty easy. You set up your variables here and look at what the first row is telling you. The first row is telling you that 3 minus 4i times x plus nothing times y plus nothing times z adds up to nothing. So you immediately, you know, all of this stuff over here is just zero. You immediately conclude that x is zero on this problem. Now, the minute that x is zero, you can use that knowledge when you're figuring out y and z from the last row. Okay, so x is zero. So look at this last row then. What does the last row become? Well, it's one times x, but x was zero. Four times y minus four i times z is equal to zero. That's, the, that's what the third row of the matrix gives you because the x is gone, right? We already know that x is zero. So of course here you can just cancel the fours and you can just set up, I'll come over here to just write this out really fast. Z is a free variable now, right? Z is free and then Y will just be equal to I times Z. So when you move the uh, I to the other side of the equal sign, you can solve for Y. So here is your set of, set of equations for X, Y, and Z. And so your basis vector there, if you bust out the T, if you bust out the T, this is going to be your basis for that eigenspace. And then, of course, as I mentioned, when you have negative 4i, you're going to get the, remember how you do the, the conjugate eigenvalue? You just conjugate the eigenvector. So 0 just stays as 0, 1 just stays as 1, and we just have to put a minus in front of the i to get the eigenvector for the uh, for that eigenspace okay so these are just one dimensional eigenspaces by the way i know that my matrix is non defective even from the beginning because my three lambdas are all different there's no repeats there so for sure this is a non defective matrix I did two of the eigenspaces for you right here. You do have to look at the uh, lambda equals three, but that one is not so messy because there's no imaginary numbers in it. So I'll let you guys kind of finish that one. Does this make sense, what I'm saying here? The matrix looks pretty bad, but I'm gonna cross off a row and hopefully leave myself with a manageable uh, set of equations to work with from there. Okay, uh, I'm a little bit over time already. What I'm going to do is I'm gonna go ahead and stop uh, the actual formal class right now, but I'm gonna stay right here and see if, if any of you want to stick around and ask any questions about the homework. I'm just gonna stay right here for the next however long you guys want to talk. Um, if there's people still here and I'll be happy to do that. But that's all I've got in terms of the material for today. I hope everything's clear. I hope everybody enjoyed uh, sections 8.1 and 8.2. Um, I will post this video and um, I'll be back again on Thursday for those of you who are, who are ready to take off. I'll say farewell for now, stay safe. I'll see you Thursday. And um, for anybody who wants to hang around and unmute themselves and ask some questions, you're more than welcome to do so.